everybody. How are you? Good. Welcome. Um, we all good, Rick? Yes. Um, I wear glasses now. That's something that's changed since the pandemic. So, and I'm still not used to wearing them. So forgive me if I'm clumsy with them tonight. Uh, my name is Marie Hardy. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation to pay my respects to elders past and present, to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, the Hill of Content, our beautiful booksellers are at the back of the room tonight, who we must support while they're still on that hill. And uh, Patrick will be signing books at the end of the session. I will remind you at the end of the session. Um, we will chat for about 45 minutes and I will leave some time at the end for Q&A so you can ruminate now. As we all know, don't monologue, ask a question. That's why I know everyone says, oh no, we won't monologue and then everyone fucking monologues. But we won't want tonight, we're not going to monologue. Um, I will introduce beautiful Patrick DeWitt. <laughs> Patrick DeWitt is the author of The Sisters Brothers, uh, which won the Governor General's Award and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and Walter Scott Prize. He also is the author of Ablutions, which was a New York Times editor's choice, Under Major Domo Minor, and French Exit, which was shortlisted for the Giller Prize. His latest book, which we will, of course, be discussing tonight, is The Librarianist. Please welcome the beautiful Patrick DeWitt. Hi, friend. Hi. Welcome back to Australia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, oh, God, I wish you could have known what we were talking about backstage. It was so it juicy. It was good. It was, it was so good. juicy. At one point, Patrick goes, you can talk about that on stage. I'm like, oh. and he goes, no, you can't. So, but it was good. Get me drunk afterwards, I'll tell you. Um, uh, I feel like the world's changed a little bit since you were last here. Yeah. You were last in Australia for Melbourne Writers Festival 2019. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. And um, while you were here, you were here to talk about French accent with the wonderful Michael Williams. And while you were here, you were working on a new book. Yeah. And uh, I remember it was causing you quite a lot of consternation. And um, during that book tour, you lost accidentally 50 pages of The Librarianist. Is that correct? Yeah. I, but you sh back, backtracking, I, it had taken me a really long time to get to the point of knowing the book, knowing the universe of the book, knowing where the characters were. It had been... It was sort of just a slow going project from start to end. But getting over that initial hump was unusually laborious. And I finally got over it. And I was sort of burning through the work. And it felt really good because it had been eight months or something of not having that feeling and, and, and the characters being elusive to me and feeling like maybe I should give up on it. And then I got 50 pages down that were, I felt solid and usable. And then I lost them in a computer snafu. <laughs> and then I came here. <laughs> and you did, you did have like Vietnam vet eyes when yeah. I remember. I was like, welcome to the festival. He's like, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that was. Well, yeah. You're not really supposed to be able to lose files, but I found a way to do it. And uh, the common refrain, because I would complain to anyone that was listening, anyone that was near me on the plane or walking down the street near me, I was stopping them and explaining that what had happened, and, and everyone said, well, just you can just write it again. It's only 50 pages. It's not the entire book, which makes sense in a way, but it also doesn't because I've likened it to repainting a painting. You can remember more or less what the painting was about, what it looked like, where the characters in the painting were, but it wouldn't be the same painting. Mm. And also, painting that painting wouldn't be fun, you know? in the way that the writing those first 50 pages was, was, was exceedingly fun because I was finally doing it. OK, fine. Um, so I came here, I flew here, knowing that I was now in a process of mourning a book that was not going to be written. I wasn't going to dust it off and try again. And something happened in the course of my being here, and I think that it was just it may have been you. I thought so. I thought I didn't want to say, but I, I assumed it was that. Or yeah. may have been partly you, and partly just the idea that I honestly I was missing working on it, and I was missing the char the characters, primarily the character of, of Bob, the protagonist, and that feeling was sort of constant enough and strong enough that I thought, well, fine, when I go back home, I'll start again, but I won't work on that section. I'll work on another section. 
And so one of the reasons why the timeline in the book is somewhat idiosyncratic in that it starts in the relative present and then it sort of works backwards and then returns to the present. But I had written it chronologically. So the runaway section, Bob is 11 mm -hmm. years old and it's late, late 1945, mid 1945. Anyway, that's the section that I had lost, the first 50 pages of you know, the, a version of that runaway section. And I couldn't face that material having just lost it. So I thought, well, I'll just write this other section of the book, which is him as a senior man helping out at a senior center, knowing that I would set it to rights eventually, chronologically. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. Anyway, when I laid it all out, I wrote it in the sequence that it's published in, and it just seemed best some way. So I just kept it in the idiosyncratic timeline that wasn't my intention at the start. It might be um, too soon to say this, because that was only 2019. But I do know that you, you just said you couldn't face writing Bob from scratch and, as you just said, uh, starting that narrative. So in a way, was it, and please don't hit me for saying this, a blessing in disguise because it, it did ultimately, I love the structure of the librarian yeah. is that there are all these different segments. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't lament it because I like the book. You know, I think that it's, 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 its imperfections are fascinating to me. And it's very common uh, for mistakes to lead to something worthwhile. As often as not, they lead to something that's not worthwhile, and then that's, that part is discarded or whatever, but it is um, consistently interesting to me, the role of mistakes and errors in the life of an artist. Uh, I know, I mean, I know you said you don't know how people can lose 50 pages on a computer, and even when I was, when I knew at the time, and I was re-researching re for, for tonight, it, it, everyone has takes their computer to someone who can find things. It kind yeah. of staggers me. But then again, it doesn't because I know what a lot of you are. No, I took it to three <laughs> computer people. But also, do you still have a flip phone? Yes. <laughs> Works like a charm. I can T9, I can T9 text with my eyes closed. I read um, this interview because Patrick is just so notoriously averse to technology and so and uses a flip phone, which is really frustrating when you want to send pictures to him. But um, and he just gets like emoji and kind of like XX YY. But um, so when you said you lost fifty pages, I'm like, it's there somewhere. He just doesn't know where to look. Yeah. But um, I was reading that in 2015, you were saying you didn't have a television and you didn't have an internet connected at the house, so you could uh, concentrate more on your writing. So you really push technology away, did your relationship with technology change somewhat during the pandemic and lockdowns in the way that we all came to rely a little bit more on those things right. for connection? Well, I did get a, my, my parents bought a big fancy television, so they had a less fancy, smaller television that they were just going to, you know, throw away or give to the Salvation Army or something, so I took it. And um, so I, I have a DVD player. I don't watch, like I don't have cable, but I watch DVDs. But I'm surprised you don't have a VHS player at this point. No, it's not quite that bad. <laughs> but now a big part of my life is going to the library and it's and just getting whatever's there. There's also a really good video store because it's Portland and. Mm. Um, but yeah, so getting DVDs from the library is different than paying for them because typically when you're paying for them, you don't, you're less willing to take a chance, even though it's like a small amount of money. Just you go into it with the mindset of you want something that's like a sure bet generally. But at the library, it doesn't matter. So I just grab anything that looks remotely interesting. And it's led to me watching some really strange films. So that's been fun. And has it, you know, I mean, I think we all, Melbourne had, had such, a, such a big lockdown and then there were some things that we did a lot in lockdown that people think, I can't face that anymore. How, do, you, do you still watch movies with a certain amount of regularity? I do, yeah. Most nights I watch, I pretty much watch a movie a day at this point, unless I'm reading a book or working on something that's, you know, supersedes all other concerns. But... Um, I read enough in the day and I work enough in the day, so usually at night it's part of, I have a whole very sort of regimented ritual and at some point I turn a movie on. What's a recent favorite movie? Really weird um, Rip Torn movie called Payday from the 70s. He plays like this alcoholic, horrific, nightmare country singer. And um, written by Don Carpenter who wrote a novel called Hard Rain Falling. Uh -huh. He was a compatriot of Richard Brodigan. This is what I mean, like the library just, it's like, what well, this looks, I love Rip Torn, this looks really bad, I'm gonna take it home and watch it. <laughs> and it was kind of brilliant. And then you see that it was written by Don Carpenter. There was so many movies that aren't really celebratable or out on Criterion or 
you know, mm. haven't been rediscovered, but they exist on DVD somehow. And uh, it's my job to find them and watch them. It also, Most of them are unwatchable, by the way. <laughs> like, when I say watch a movie, I'm not sitting there paying particularly close attention. Like, I'm playing the guitar, I'm probably stoned, I, I've got my dog, I'm eating cake or something. I'm doing a bunch like a of things. In, yeah. I'm doing a bunch of things at once. Um, but some of the movies are, they deliver above and beyond expectation. Do you have that same thing with movies? Because I know with books, you said you don't like people giving you books because you people go, Patrick, he's got, you know, this crazy taste in books. And you're like, I like to be the one that discovers them. Yeah. Do you have that same thing with movies that you no. like to find the... No, I don't. I hadn't thought of it, but I don't. I don't, re I don't relish book recommendations, and I don't like when people buy me books and say, you're going to love this. And I think I talked about it somewhere else, but uh, I think of my reading as being part, not just part of my work, but it's my, my quest. I'm sure most readers feel this way, like this is mm. the quest I'm, I'm embarked on, and like, why are you getting involved in my quest? This is my, que <laughs> this is my quest. I didn't Get the ask fuck out of my quest. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. When, um, when Patrick and I last saw each other, it was March 2020, and we went out for brunch in Los Angeles. And I would say mere days after that, well, it was probably going on when we met, the world tilted quite significantly on its axis. Uh, and I don't even remember if we were talking about it at brunch. It was sort of like... No, it was a was, thing. It was kind of weird. Because I, rem kind of I remember weird. they were saying, there was all sorts of, are we going to be able to fly? Mm. Am I going to have to drive home from Los Angeles to Oregon? Um, but we got out. We got out by the skin of our teeth. We well, did. Well, you went. To, you went to the Madonna Inn. We, I did. I did. Yeah. So I. I think I had another four or five days before our previous leader, who shall not be named, uh, said he was going to close the borders and do a very incompetent job. He didn't announce that at the time, but we all sensed it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but I want to know what before before the that world tilt that I just mentioned, what that year or those years looked like for you as a writer. Did the, did the pandemic and lockdowns affect your productivity or what you were writing and how you write? How did, how did it shift what that year was going to be for you? Yeah, I think that it... I think that the... The reality of self-imposed isolation, which most artists sort of, were, you know, were isolated to a, to a degree because you need to do the work by yourself. But when you make the decision, it's one thing. But when somebody else makes the decision for you, it, it feels significantly different. I was surprised at how different it felt. Mm. And I remember in the beginning of lockdown and, and, and um, isolation and all that, just thinking, I was born for this. <laughs> this, is, this is good news, you know? <laughs> Bring it on. And I was really surprised at the depth of my... I became quite sad, I think. I, and, and it was the idea that I couldn't access these things which previously I'd had a choice to turn down. And then I missing the world too. I mean, missing, that was, travel is a big part of my life. And I, I you know, an experience like coming here, it's like, it, it's, it's, um, it's important. It's an important thing for me. And, and so the shape of my life changed as did so many people's lives change. And I was fortunate in that nobody close to me died um, or got particularly ill and, um, because of COVID, I should say. <laughs> um, but yeah, it affected my happiness and, and by extension, my ability to function as an artist. Um, a big part of why this book, I think this book, I don't think it reads when you look at it as a, as a book that was laborious or, or I hope it doesn't. But uh, it started on the wrong foot with uh, computer snafu, and then it sort of went downhill from there, owing, I think, in large part to the realities of, of the COVID isolation. Mm. And I just really was in a funk, and, and, and uh, it was reflected in my, my, my attitude towards my own work. You know, I didn't, I wasn't working with enthusiasm or, or, or curiosity in the way that I had in the past and hope to again in the future, and I'm, I'm now, actually. It just felt different, and I think that I felt burdened by the world felt to, be a, felt to me to be a sad place. Mm. And I think that it's reflected in, in certain aspects of the book, um, but it certainly changed my working habits and what I was capable of. It went much more slowly. Is a long, uh, the, it's a the, long answer to a short question. But. There's still a lot of joy in the book as well. Though. Yeah, I think so. It's, meant, it's not meant to be descriptive of a bleak state of mind. I just think that inevitably some of that bled into the text. And I think it skews a bit sadder than is the norm for me. Like, 
the comedy tragedy ratio for me, it's like measuring that out for each of the books is, is really finicky. Mm. And this time it was like, ah, sad's fine. Just like it's sad. Be a little bit more sad than it's sadder than it would have been, I think, if it weren't for COVID. I read this. Um, there was a description of the librarianess, which I thought was very COVID-y, um, which said, Patrick DeWitt depicts the loneliness and fullness of an introvert's life. And I thought that's such a beautiful kind of description of that's nice. lockdown I haven't heard that. as well. Yeah. Who, who, you know? who said that? It was my mother. I didn't write that down. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, as a, as a reader, and I, I wonder if everyone else is noticing this, like I, I've actually really enjoyed watching themes of lockdown and pandemic start to permeate literature that's coming out now that has been written by writers that we love in lockdowns. I think of um, Emily St. John Mandel's Sea of Tranquility, which is a real pandemic book, and I just read uh, Sigrid Nunes's The Vulnerables, which is so fucking good. Um, and uh, in locally, Bryony Doyle's While We Are Here, which is really beautiful. Some people have a real aversion to reading anything about that you know that time. Yeah. Do Do you want to read about? I don't. No. No. I don't. No. I don't. And maybe I will one day, but I, I suspect not. Um, I keep an ear to the ground in so far as a lot of my friends are authors, and so they we all we you know we can take sort of a temperature even if we don't live in the same town. You know we're in touch. I became aware of the idea that with surprising speed, people were already beginning like by April of that year or something. April, April 2020. Yeah, I mean, I would hear, was hearing murmurings of, oh, so-and-so is writing a, a lockdown novel. And I just, it made me feel pretty peevish. I you were just sweaty. <laughs> no, just like, I just don't want to. Uh, and yeah, and I have an aversion to reading about any number of things, and that, and that would be one of them. I, it's not something that... But, you know, the wonderful thing about storytelling is you can enter into a story with your arms crossed, and then the quality of the work is such that you uncross your arms. And so maybe that'll happen to me and... It'll sort, sort me out. But writers absorb what is going on in a global societal sense and, and reflect it back. So yeah. it's kind of, you know, it's inevitable that there are going to be books about the pandemic because they were people who write literature were trapped inside their houses trying sure. to understand the same thing that we're all trying to understand. In the same way, you watched after 9-11... You know, either there were the Don DeLillo's The Falling Man, but then there were always, like, someone had a character whose dad died in 9-11 in a book. He just watched these little... Yeah. I think that's going to be... It's going to be pretty present in literature for... Yeah, yeah. And there's nothing, I, there's nothing wrong with it, uh, uh, obviously. I just... Um, when it's like something happens, A, and then there's a book written about it, B, I prefer the, the connection of those... I, I prefer a murkier connection in some way. I don't necessarily want my my work or the work of the men and women that I read to reflect a particular moment, especially if I've lived through it, you know? Mm. I don't know. This comes back to the idea, I think, that I'm an escapist, too, you know, which I say, and I think it's true, but it's kind of a complicated thing to say. Um, I eat the news in the way that we all eat the news, but I don't necessarily have anything to say about the state of the world. Besides, like, oh, fuck, like, you know, I don't know what to say about it all. I don't have that kind of mind that can make sense of the chaos of the world. Mm. And as a reader, I, I think a lot of my reading skews antique because it's out of my time, and that's comforting to me somehow, or it feels more universal, I suppose. Things that are of the minute, I'm wary of things that are of the minute because minutes pass mm. in a minute. And then what? What happened to that story that was, like, so... Things that mean something now are things that are, are... Sometimes you'll hear a song and it'll define the moment, you know? And a year later, it, it, something has happened to the song. So as thinking of my own work, I prefer to write from a remove. Um, I do think about things like shelf life and longevity. And I want my books to make sense later, emotionally. And it, maybe books that are, that are about a particular thing that's happening right now will make less sense. It's not just those books of that kind of vague umbrella genre that you're drawn to as well. There's music and art. Yeah. There's a really kind of counterculture world that you very comfortably inhabit. There's an element of outsider to you as well. I mean, you, you, the way you became a writer was giving your manuscript to someone in a bar that gave it to someone else. Mm -hmm. You were never kind of formally trained, as it were. So is that sense of the... Is there a part of you wanting to maintain that outsider status by what you consume? I don't know. 
I think the things that I consume, I consume because they appeal to me. Just it's, it's not complicated. Mm. I don't think that there's an ulterior motive. Um, regarding my being an outsider, this came up recently where somebody was asking me where I, where do you think you sit in the landscape? And I really don't feel con that connected to the landscape, even though there's any number of contemporary authors I admire. Not that I, there's schools anymore or anything, like the New York School or whatever. Like there's, there's not these teams the way that maybe there once was. But um, I don't really know. I feel out of it in a way that pleases me, mm. you know? I'm just on the side here. I'm not bother bothering anyone. I'm just doing my thing. And that it's comforting that I'm, in, that I'm allowed to do that. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, you'll all be pleased to know that when Patrick was driven here from the airport, the taxi driver asked him if he was a Swifty. Yeah. No, that was a, ta that was a taxi today. Oh, that was a First taxi thing, today. First thing, he's like, you're Swifty? And I was like, no. And, he <laughs> said, and then he said, Jonas Brothers? And I said, no. And then he said, what music do you like? <laughs> As though those are the only two choices. And I was trying to sum it up, and I said, I guess punk rock. And he goes, ah, Blink-182. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's my favorite band, Blink-182. You got it. I just also love the idea of someone looking at you going, Swifty. Swifty? Swifty, yeah. that's great. Um, yeah. If we go back to the librarianist, I know that apart from just the structural changes of the book due to the, in your words, snafu, uh, the, this was a really difficult and laborious book for you to land, covid all that sort of stuff. Uh, in an earlier version of the novel, Bob's ex-wife was the librarian and he was an ex-beatnik living on the streets. Yeah. And uh, I really like that you referred to that iteration of Bob as an eccentric and much more of a typical Patrick DeWitt character if such a thing exists. Yeah. What shifted that version of Bob? Was it just all in the weeds of the story showing itself to you? I think that I, for the first time, this is novel five, for the first time, I thought I, I really set out to celebrate a different kind of character, or to spend time with a different kind of character, per my body of work, right? So it wasn't that the Bob as beatnik was 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 going particularly badly. It's just that it felt familiar in a negative way, like oh, I'm doing my thing. He's going to be a real kook, and this book is filled with kooks, but it's not necessarily focused on one. Mm. I just had the sense of it being redundant. And that seemed dangerous to me. And um, as one's body of work grows, I think one should be wary of repetition. Um, so it was just fe fearfulness, really, or, or just a sort of sense in the back of my mind of, I could do this, but does that mean that I should do this? Uh, so I pulled back from that. But then, you know, there's a, the, 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 the section of the book where Bob runs away is a flashback situation, and it's filled with eccentrics who chat insanely and relentlessly. And it's very much of a piece with my earlier work. But I sort of gave myself a break or something. Like, I got to that point. The rest of the book is much more rooted in, it's still fantastical in, in that people aren't really, don't really behave that way or speak that way. But that section is very much like, say, French Exit or Under Major Domo, mm. or even Sisters Brothers. It's, it's, um, and it's, it felt really good to return to it after sort of steering myself away from that impulse. Um, but it also felt good to recognize that it was finite and it was only going to be a piece of the book and not the book entire. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with my engagement with characters, like the kooky characters and, 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 and the banter and everything like that. I'm, gonna all, I'm always going to do it. I'm just trying to mix things up a bit. And... Um, not do it so, quite so precisely as the book that preceded it, do you know? Do you hear critics when you write? Not when I write. I hear them loud and clear after the book comes out. Do you, do you, read, re, you read reviews? <laughs> I don't read them. If it's bad, I skim it, but I, I, I read just enough to get offended and to, fe and to feel contempt uh, or pain if they're correct, which generally I find that they're not. <laughs> um, criticism is something I think that should be taken in a sense, it's, it's, it's a taking of medicine, and I think that, that it's part of the tradition, you know, of public art making. What do the people think? There's an attitude that some adopt where, whereby they claim to not care, but I care, I do care, and I do want 
people I admire or respect to admire and respect the work. And so when that doesn't line up, it's painful. But it's also, I think, supremely healthy to be battered a bit publicly. It's just good for a person. Um, in the way that like a cold plunge is probably good for you or, or uh, shock treatment. Um, I don't, the bad, there was a bad review. The first review that came out was a negative review and it was for this book and it was a review lamenting that I hadn't, like I'd lost something uh, from, it wasn't, this was somebody who had loved the Sisters Brothers. Mm. And he, he was saying this isn't, uh, basically saying why doesn't he do that again? And uh, while on the one hand I understand that and even am sympathetic to that, it's sort of pointed to a fundamental misunderstanding of what I'm actually doing and, and who I actually hope to become. And it, it hurt my feelings, you know? There's no way around it. It's just, and it ruined my day. It really screwed up my whole day. I was in a, such a good mood and then I read that and it was just, that was it. And I sat around my house and glowered a bit and felt sorry for myself. And then the next day that feeling's completely gone and you just get on to the next thing. Mm. So it's not... It doesn't live with you for, for very long, uh, but it does hurt when it happens. Who do you hope to become? Well, I don't really know is the true answer, but I, I hope to be someone who lives lo a long time and continues to feel engaged. I just hope to, to, to continue to feel, to be lucky enough to have the time to, to write these books. And um, I hope that I'm, when it's, if I were to somehow magically be able to look at my, a, a long body of work, say like double the length that it is now, I hope that that body of work would surprise me in some way, in terms of the subject matter, the form, my relationship to language, and I hope that the books would be, I would think of them as being worthwhile, you know? Uh, I love that uh, there's a version in The Making of the Librarianess which, which you wrote in first person, yeah. and it bothered you because Bob would never say that much. Yeah. So you rewrote it, the whole book, in third person. And I want to know at which point did your publisher want to strangle you in the Helen. making of this yeah, my, book? My editor, my, the editor I worked with most closely was my US editor, Helen. And she, the whole write, the, the entire period of time writing the book, I wrote it in first person. And I hadn't written in first person since Sisters Brothers, and I wanted to return to it because I really wanted to, for the reader to exist within the consciousness of this person. And so I you know, wrote, wrote the whole book along those lines. I submitted it, it was accepted. I went through edits with US, UK and Canadian editors and it was about to go into copy edits. It's like small things, grammar, moving commas around and things, clarification. But preceding that, the thing that had been bothering me throughout the Many things had been bothering me during the writing of the book, but this, there was some nameless thing in the back of the room. And then I realized what it was, which was that Bob wouldn't talk this much. He wouldn't share this much of himself. And that it was wrong. Not just that it was uncomfortable making, but that it was incorrect. So I was pretty p fatigued, you know, burnt out by this point, but I knew it had to be changed. And so I contacted Helen and I just said, like, how long do I have before this book is printed? You know, how, how, long, how much time do I have? And she's like, why? You know, she said, this why? isn't, why? there is no Helen. Helen's not here, yeah, don't yeah. call anymore. Why would you ask me that question? And I said, listen, and I explained, and she recognized, she didn't necessarily agree, but she recognized that it was important to me. And she recognized that it, it, that it was correct for me to change it. And believe me, I did not want to rewrite the entire book. And re changing perspective, from first to third, I didn't have to rewrite the entire book, but you do have to take a lot into account and you do lose a lot. Because all the, you know, internal monologue and mm. all this stuff, so. When I, the original book, when I printed it out, was over 700 pages long. And it's now three something. So I, 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 in the course of edits, I cut a lot, but then I cut even more when I changed the voice from third, from first to third, rather. Um, Helen didn't want to strangle me, she just was like, you know, okay, yeah, you've got six weeks or whatever, but God, you know. <laughs> um, hope it wasn't annoying for her. I think she just was sort of worried for me maybe or just, you know, it sounded like uh, an insane thing to do at that late date. But she gave me her blessings and I went off and did it and it was difficult and, and um, I, by, the end of, by the end of writing this book, I just thought, you know, 
I really need a vacation or something. I, I was very, very emotionally fatigued. But with all that to say, the book wound up being the book that I wanted it to be, I think. And then also I think that decision to change it from thir first to third was, 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 very, was, was correct. I think it would have been wrong. I think there w and it would have continued to bother me. And it, may have, it might have spoiled my relationship with the book. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in a fortunate position in that my books, even if I don't necessarily agree with the decisions I made, the aesthetic decisions or the stylistic decisions, like if I look at ablutions now, I just, I couldn't write like that anymore. I wouldn't write like that, I should say. Um, and there's so much that I show that I wouldn't show now. And, um, but I, but I'd, I, I root from all my, I'm rooting from my books. I don't feel a sense of missed opportunity or shame or that, that any one thing is glaringly wrong. And if I hadn't changed this from first to third, I think, I w I think it would have lingered. I think it might have spoiled things for me. What did, what, you said you were so fatigued and burnt out at the end of writing it. What, what nice thing did you do for yourself after finishing it? Well, when you finish a book, and you finish it any number of times, but when it's done, 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 you finish the copy edits and they're starting to talk about the cover and the copy and all that sort of stuff, and there's nothing more for you to do. I always have this reaction which used to puzzle me and now is just life, which is I don't feel accomplished, I don't feel good, I feel peevish, I feel angry. And it's, it's mysterious to me, I don't know why I feel that way. I'm not angry at the book, I'm not angry at any one person, I'm not angry at myself, I don't feel that I should have done something differently or chosen a different profession, but I just am, I don't know, I don't know what it is, it's bizarre. So I didn't really do much. I started working on a television show like two days later or even a day later. I can't really relax if I'm not working. If I'm traveling and doing something and I'm not working, then that's one thing. But if I'm at home and I'm not working, that I just don't feel, I don't feel good. So I, I just tend to start working right, right over. Right what away. do you, I'm just, I'm just from writer to writer, I'm just curious about what your routine is. I'm a, I'm a daytime writer. I'm, I'm, yeah. I keep pretty much office hours and I don't write at night. And I'm also really conscious of days when I'm sitting there and nothing is happening sure. and yeah. I stay there anyway. Because yeah. surely, I mean, I would assume that not every day you wake up and write X amount of pages. So, no. so what is your routine and what does it look like on the days that the words aren't coming? If it's not coming, then it's not coming and that's okay. And Do you stop and do something else? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And there's, I've got lots, you know, lots of things that I like to do. Um, I've actually been writing a lot of poetry lately. So I'm working on a book of poems. Um, I'm working on this television show, which is just a spec TV show. I'm just, it's a daydream at this point. Can I, it's, a, it's a violent comedy. Yeah. Which I'm like, that's a, that's a great genre. Yeah. Um, comedy of violence. <laughs> but um, I walk my dog. I see my pals. Um, I spend time with my son and his girlfriend who live with me. There's lots to do. There's, you know, everyone has their little life, and I've got mine. Um, but if things are working, like if I'm working on something and it's I'm in it, then it's fairly common. The, my my days become Groundhog Day e, Groundhog Day ish. I wake up at a common sensible hour. I eat. I walk the dog, and then I sit down to work. I'm not one of these people who says or claims to be able to write for long, long hours. If I get a couple hours out of it, of actual sitting and writing, then that's, then that's good. Mm. Um, but you're never, or I'm never granted very much distance from a long form project, by which I mean, even if I'm, the reason it's okay if nothing's coming that day is because I'm still writing the book, even if I'm not writing it that day, or even for a period of days, because sometimes you hit a wall and it just involves a lot of rumination and consideration and, and um, addition and subtraction. So my bedroom is also my office, and I've got my two desks and my guitar and everything. And so I'll, it's a lot of walking and moving around the room and reading a book for 10 minutes and going over and pecking at the typewriter or the laptop. I was about to say, do yeah. you have the... Guitar, <laughs> guitar. No wonder you lost your 50 pages. You're on a yeah, typewriter. Yeah, yeah. Um, I ride my penny farthing bicycle <laughs> to the, uh, I'm not a steampunk. Um, but then, so this, but the, the second part of my work day is, so it's like maybe two, three hours of actual work in the daytime, but then lots of sort of thinking about the work and wondering and reading other books and, and um, gleaning uh, inspiration from the authors I admire. And then at night, uh, before I watch the movie, I get stoned, and then I look at the work I 
did that morning, sober, and I mess it up. And I make a lot of notes, and I, I, I um, this is like where the ideas come from. Mm. I do a sm I smoke a small amount of low THC marijuana, which at this point in, you know, in the states, like everybody's stoned, constantly, <laughs> on every corner. There's a marijuana store on every corner, mm. um, so it's not taboo at all. Like it's not doesn't you know you can smoke joints in front of cops, doesn't matter. So I smoke a little bit of weed. And then I look at the work I wrote sober, and then I, I think about it, and I ask myself questions, and I write down the questions, and I write down the ideas. And then the next morning, before I begin work proper, I look at the notes the stone person made the night before. <laughs> and so it's a collaboration between this free, this freewheeler, this evening freewheeler, and then this um, dutiful coffee drinking nerd, you know, in the morning. That's great. I yeah. used to, when I, d I did breakfast radio for two years and occasionally drunk Marie would lay out clothes for morning Marie oh, to yeah. wear and I'd wake up at 4 a.m. and go, oh, okay, yeah. is that what we're wearing? Oh, all right. That's it. Um, it's like a little present that's left for you by the nighttime persona. Yeah. Um, Patrick also uh, reminded me that the term, I've been using the term California sober. Do you guys know what that term is? So, because we were talking about no one in, in Hollywood drinks anymore, no one drinks alcohol anymore because, of the, you know, they were on gummies and they, it's just very prolific. Everyone's sort of um, smoking pot. And um, I thought Calis California soda just meant no alcohol, but you still, like, took cocaine and stuff like that. But apparently it's just no booze just, and weed. Just weed, yeah. All right, so... If my understanding, my understanding of well, it Well, if anyone knows, please tell us because we have a different understanding of California soda. It's a great term, though. Um... I have lots of friends who are in AA and NA, Narcotics and Alcoholics Anonymous. And I say, because I used to drink like, to excess and I don't drink anymore and I don't do anything about it, I just don't do it. Like I don't go to meetings about it. But my friends are, who, who have gotten a lot out of it and arguably their lives have been saved by this program are always sort of encouraging me to come. And I said, but I'm, I, I'm a, like a stoner basically. I, I'm just not drinking or doing hard drugs anymore. They said, well, you don't have to bring that up at the meetings. You know, just, just come to the meetings. And it's, it's L.A. and nobody really cares as long as you don't show up drunk or, like, you know, narcotized on Class A, mm. uh, Coke or heroin or whatever. Like, it's fine. But you it's haven't fine. had a drink for years, have you? I actually had a gin not that long ago. Oh. Yeah, just to, just to do it. I was having a really lovely – there's a musician named Michael Hurley who's like – Oh, a, I saw him play. No, oh, yeah. He's amazing. He yeah. plays at the corner bar – in Portland? Of course he does. No, it's but it's amazing. Portland. And he plays at this really sort of shaggy bar and you go and you see him. And all my friends were there and he was playing just the most beautiful set, heartbreaking music. Mm. And he's one of my favorite living artists. And it felt so special. The sun was coming through. It was just dusk uh, in, in really autumn. And I thought, I should have a gin <laughs> just to make it that much better. And I turned to my friend Eric and I said, I'm going to have a drink. And it had been years, many yeah. years. Yeah. And he said, oh, no, you don't want to do that. And I said, I'm just going to have one drink. And he said, oh, God. So I went and had one drink, and that was it. It was a great drink. It was strong. I really enjoyed it. And it, it sort of did what I wanted it to do, which was just, like, you know, put the final touches on this, like, almost. It was really a perfect moment, and I just made it a little bit more perfect, I guess, with the gin. But there was the concern, too. I mean, the next day I kind of thought, well, maybe I could just have a gin every mm. once in a while. And then it's like, no, 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 you just... So it's foolhardy behavior on my part. No. But I don't really think about alcohol anymore. I, I really don't. And that sort of, that was in recognition of that. There was a phase of time where I really missed it. Mm. And I really wanted to drink. I had an impulse to drink insanely in response to my not having had drinks for however many months. Like, you know, really go for it. And that, uh, that's just absent. So you hear of people uh, over a period of years or decades going back to moderation but I think that's the minority story. It's not I, I the would majority. Say so, is yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, you're really lucky. That's your access to it as well. Yeah. Well, the truth is that I, I'm ha my my life has improved a lot, absent alcohol, just in terms of peace of mind and, and a sense of calm. You know, well, my life is quite hectic, especially if you're traveling a lot. It's just sort of like you go from one sort of like minor disaster to the next, which can be fun, <laughs> but it's also taxing. You know. And I'm not getting any younger, so that was a part of it, is my liver at a certain point was just like, no, nope, mm. sorry, buddy, party's over. There's, I mean, uh, you, I mean, anyone in this room would know from reading a certain brand of chaotic writers, there are writers who would throw themselves into that 
all those chaotic experiences so they had something to write about. Yeah. It sounds like you had those chaotic experiences and now you draw a lot of that from sort of a patchwork quilt of or the antique books that you read and the characters that you see in films so you don't need to throw yourself into the fire, as it were. Well, I think the first book was representative of... Like, I think I got it out of my system. And, and I didn't like... The first book was about a bar I worked at in Hollywood where I worked for six years as a dishwasher. And I didn't like the experience of, you know, it said I worked at a bar in the bio, so everyone reading it made the mm. correlation, and I had to discuss it sort of ad nauseum. And people really wanted me to be a depraved person, like they're disappointed if I wasn't as depraved as maybe they thought I was going to be. And there was a sort of tabloid element. Not that pr very many people read that book, but, you know, in terms of the interviews, the, the modest amount of press that I did for that book, that was the only thing that was really discussed with any sort of keen interest was, was are you the protagonist or were you the protagonist? And I, that, that seemed like a dead end to me. It seemed kind of just dull to talk about and it seemed to belittle the work in some way. And it, and it pigeonholes you to a degree. Yeah. I, think, um, I feel like, is it DBC Pierre who, did I get that right? That um, would always, was like the messiest bitch at every writer's festival. And everyone's like, here he comes. It, like, it was just, I don't know if he had the capacity to be anyone else because the expectation of he's going to be the guy holding up the bar at 3 a.m. Yeah. came yeah. so heavily. It's hard to be that him. guy. I, I only witnessed him drinking once or twice. And I found him just deadly charming, mm. really, really charming guy. In spite of, he, he clearly had had a couple, but he maintained, uh, you know, a gentlemanly drinker, maybe. Oh, that's good. I hadn't tipped him over into... No, he was, he was very sweet and funny and cognizant. So some people can pull it off for life, but I couldn't. Um, uh, well, uh, well, questions in about five... That's a five-minute call, ladies and gentlemen, five-minute call. Um, uh, <laughs> when, uh, when Sisters Brothers was nominated for the Booker, you were, um, I say plunged, you weren't really plunged, into uh, what you refer to as the readability scandal, which I, oh, know, yeah. I know pissed you off. Yeah. Do, uh, do you think you've got a complicated relationship with that term now? No, looking back, I can't believe that I cared. It's just a silly thing to allow myself to feel affected by. But you have to understand... The reception of ablutions was was lovely in its sense, in a sense, but it was it was very modest. And then suddenly, you know, when when a, a book of yours is shortlisted for a prize of that size, you experience something like fame. I don't think there's really such a thing as like a famous author anymore. But um, you know, I went to London and like cabbies were recognizing me and stuff like that just for that week. You know, the next week they wouldn't have recognized me. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, and, and there's, they're betting on it at Ladbrokes and stuff, you know. So it was just, and I was drinking heavily. And it was just, it, it felt, it was exciting. But it was, I couldn't really enjoy it because I wasn't prepared for it emotionally. I didn't understand what it meant. Um, I still hadn't really digested how I felt about that book. Mm. I just wasn't ready for, for attention on that level. You know, I wasn't mature enough to handle any sort of attention on that level. And um, it was just a confusing time. And then what happened was one of the judges, I think, made the mistake. I think it was a mistake to, to reference the desire on the part of the judges to... They wanted to hold up books that were readable, right, as opposed to something that was more complex or complicated. And... There was a, a big outcry, and a lot of um, very prominent, much more famous and powerful authors than I came out sort of condemning the list. Maybe not the books in particular, but by extension of their critique of this word readability, I was lumped in with a group, of, with a group that was considered to be lesser than or something. Do you know what I mean? Not mm. literary enough. And that felt really shitty. And I didn't know who to like punch about it because it, it was... <laughs> There was not any one particular person that should have been punched. Um, so that was, that was hard in that moment. Um, but when I think of it now, I just, again, like I just can't believe that it, if that happened now, I, I wouldn't even, it would, would mean let, not, nothing to me. Uh, but I mean, but again, you're, you're older, yeah. you have maturity, you're, you're sober, you've had a lot more success since then. It's yeah, yeah. kind of a really rough thing to to throw someone who's still grappling with their own sense of self, their own creative totally. voice on the page into that. And I think that term is a bit fucking bullshit readable yeah. as well. I remember 
Now, speaking of punching someone, I nearly got into a punch on with Howard Jacobson because because um, I dared speak ill of D. H. Lawrence, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I think he, yeah, he was. Uh, fist clenched and um, I think I held I can't remember what the book was and he goes oh I suppose it's readable is it is it readable and I'm like well that's what fucking books should be readable yeah. well you as know, opposed like... as opposed to unreadable like yeah, uh, yeah. Um, no I understand what I think the judge was reaching for in, in naming that and what they were saying was you know basically they wanted books that were I mean I think of I think of my books as I want my books to be accessible to a layperson I am I am a layperson Mm. I'm not highly educated. I'm, I'm, you know, and I remember being a dishwasher, a high school dropout and a dishwasher and reading books that I just were not for me because I had not gone to college, you know? So it's nothing to, to besmirch artists who speak in that code, but it is a code. And um, I, I'm, I'm for functionality. Mm. Within the confines of functionality, you can get away with the weirdest like, you can go as obscure and dark as you want, but present it in a way that makes sense to the layperson, you know? I'm for it. But I think there's sometimes, there's sometimes joy to be found in... I, I'm, I'm absolutely with you, and they're, they're usually the books that I gravitate towards as well, but sometimes it's fun to watch a, reader, a writer at the top of their craft show off a little on the page and go, look what I can, I'm so clever. And yeah. you're like, that's, the story has to drag you, the story and the characters have to pull you in no yeah. matter what style they do it in, but something there's, sometimes there's something fun about that flashiness. Yeah, yeah. And when I talk about the books that I gravitate towards, I mean, I'm not talking about Stephen King or something like that. Like, that's not what I'm after. You know, a lot of my favourite authors are... are perhaps would be considered unreadable by that judge, maybe. You know, mm. Thomas Bernhard or uh, Robert Walzer or I don't know. But I want a human being talking to me. Do you know what I'm saying? When I'm reading a book, I want somebody to speak to me and they're coming at me from my level, whatever my, my level is. But as soon as somebody arrives and they're speaking to me from on high, I start, you know, I, I tend to head for cover. Because okay. I'm, I'm not looking to... Worship. Have Any, they, anyone. Have you read Stephen King? I haven't. Why not? Snobby? Because I'm a snob. Because I'm a snob. Because it's too readable. No. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's like a book about a really bad dog. It's like a really, really bad dog. It's like, how good can that book be? I would listen to a podcast of you just critiquing Stephen King. King Wilkes. I don't know. There's a clown in a drain. I don't know. Well, yeah. It sounds bad. No, I, I don't doubt that he's... he's, he's He's a masterful writer. I, I believe that he, he has to be, otherwise he wouldn't have the reaction that he, he's... But I just don't know if it's for me. I, I'm a sentence person too, you know, like I, it's... You know, I, I just... I suspect I would read it and sort of not be that interested in it. What do you mean you're a sentence person? Like, a, like uh, everything has to be just so. I'm fussy about grammar and sentences. And like, a, like sty I, I prefer stylists. I think he's more of like a plot guy than a stylist, is but my understanding. Hemingway, yes, no. I just don't think anybody should read Hemingway. <laughs> It's just like enough, why? enough, enough's why? enough. Yes. Why? Enough's enough is a very Hemingway sentence as well. Yeah, that's my uh, blurb. Enough's <laughs> enough. No, I mean, Ernest Hemingway was very much in my household growing up. All the books. Because your dad was such a huge yeah. reader, right? Yeah. And uh, is still, if I sound anno annoyed with Ernest Hemingway, it's because I've maybe had this conversation too many times with my father. Too many Thanksgiving dinners of just saying, Dad, there's so many other authors. Like, what just... Stop reading books about the guy who met him once and went, like, they killed animals together in Africa in, in the 50s. Like, I just don't understand. The, the appeal is lost to me. But I, I, I remember in high school loving A Movable Feast mm. because of its approachability. And the ending. Yeah. 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 And, but, I mean, I really, he's somebody who, at his best, I think makes, he wears his excellence very lightly and it makes it seem to a 15-year-old. He's just saying what happened. I could do this, not understanding how difficult it is to, to write that well. Hmm. So I've gone from insulting him to praising him. <laughs> the truth is probably, for me, somewhere in between. I, I can't imagine I would ever read Ernest Hemingway uh, again or reread re it. Um, and I think that, you know, he had a, decades in the sun, you know? There's other authors of the, his generation or contemporary authors who I think we should be talking about. Is, enough has been said about Ernest Hemingway. Enough's enough.
Yeah. Um, my loves, we're going to turn around to you for questions. Uh, there are some beautiful Wheeler Centre people with microphones, as you can see, either side. I can see if you put your hand up, but they can see you better. Does anyone want to get involved, recommend? No, don't recommend books. He doesn't like that. Um, anyone have any questions about the book, about previous books? Come on, you're a like, writer's crowd. Don't be shy. Really? Oh, there's one up the back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely shy. But um, you mentioned uh, when you were saying about uh, becoming the person you want to be, uh, that would be someone whose uh, works or collection of works has, a, has surprised you. Um, I'm curious if you've surprised yourself to date with your output, and if so, how? I, yeah, the, the short answer is yeah, yes. The, it's such a it's such a, it's such a glacial pace. It moves so slowly, the life of a writer, and, and books move slowly. Even like a quickly, the speediest book I wrote was a year. And then you know further for edits, it moves so slowly that you can't be too surprised. I was surprised to be writing a book, because I'd been trying for ten years, and I recognized all during those years that whatever it was I was working on wasn't going to deliver, wasn't going to bear fruit, right? Suddenly, I was writing something that I recognized could go the distance, and I knew that I could do it. That was really shocking, and it felt really good. One of the better feelings of my life, right? I'd been chasing after it for so long, and then suddenly it was happening. So that was surprising. Um, if I look at, you know, in the front of a book that says all the other books that the author has written, and when I look at that list, it, st it strikes me as an idiosyncratic list. I think it's a strange list. And I think that each of them represents some sort of a veering or pulling away, um, being sort of elusive with, with myself. But um, they all make sense to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, they all make sense to me emotionally. I look at those books and I remember where I was in the world living, what my space was like and how I was feeling. And... It, and um, None of the books were written against my will, you know? So it, it, it strikes me as common sensible when I look at the list of books, but it's, I do think it's, it's an odd list. And um, some people have said that it's curious that, it, that that list came from one hand. <laughs> and I think that what it represents is that I have changed a number of times over the years. I've become so many different people. I don't look at... You know, I think of myself in, in the era when I wrote Ablutions, I, I, I can't recognize, I don't recognize that person as myself. I see somebody who made so many decisions that I wouldn't have made. And it wasn't just the drinking, it was like, I had a different attitude towards life. I've been, when you're given the gift of, of time, which I feel I've been given for the last however many years I've been publishing books, you go deeper into yourself than you would if I were surrounded by people all day long, I would be a different person. So to sit in, sit in quiet, not that I'm a monk or anything like that, but to sit in you know, relative solitude for all those years, I think that I've gone deeper into myself than I would have normally. Um, and my relationship to language has deepened considerably because of this time that I've been fortunate enough to have. So that reality is represented in my body of work. But I, it's not as though I look at the list and go, isn't that weird that I wrote that book? I mean, it all is according to some plan, or it all makes sense in some way, but which isn't to say that it's not a weird list, because I think that it is. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it is... There's such different books which I love, but there's just a beautiful, coherent ribbon that runs through. That is you. Yeah. And I kind of love when you're talking about writing ablutions. Of course, you were so, such a different person. You were so much younger. You've lived a lot more. You've grieved. You've loved. You've lost. You've changed. And I think... It's beautiful that you allow that to guide your creative choices and you don't just go, I'm the guy that writes this thing, which a yeah. lot of other writers do, even yeah. as they've changed over decades. Right. They, they remain in that place. So I, I understand that decision great. too because it feels good to do work that makes sense to you. But I think that if you can, it's better to push a bit mm. to go beyond the border, you know. Any other questions there? That was a great question, by the way. Thank you. Yes, uh, there's... Yep. Oh. Um, uh, I was just uh, wondering, Patrick, uh, 
what um, feeds you with your um, uh, your writing and I mean I, I guess you've you've mentioned a, a number of things and and how you would see that changing in the future. I think I'm buckled in for the ride. You know what I mean? Like I, I, at this point, I recognize what I need to keep going, and it's um, relative health. Um, peace of mind. I can't write if I'm distracted by stress or strife, like I'm crippled by it. If I if I if I'm feeling depressed about something or something bad has happened, there's no point in working. So I need I need a quiet life. I need things to be calm. I need there to be peace around me and from the people that I love to to be well. And I need time. And um, the space and, and marijuana. <laughs> and um, as long as I can hang on to all of those things, my interest isn't going anywhere. My interest isn't flagging. Like as a reader, I'm, I'm as passionate a reader as I've ever been, which isn't to say I read as much as I used to because I don't, but I read. It's not just that I'm dutiful, it's that I, it's, it's, it's. At a certain point, I think that you, I, I'm arriving at a point where I feel like I. Uh, uh, my, my, my relationship to language and my life are one thing. There, there's, no, there's no division. I think for a long period of time it was aspirational. And then suddenly I was doing it after all those years writing the first book, but that didn't mean that that's what, who I was. But um, I see everything in my life through the lens of how it affects my work. So you become an obsessive. Mm. But it's a healthy obsession, I think. And it gives me purpose, and, and I feel like my days mean something to me. And then hopefully the work extends to you all, and um, that you find it entertaining. You know. Thank you. So we've got time for a couple more questions. I think oh, there's one down the front here. Is that it's coming to? Oh, there's one up the back, and then oh, I, I I see you. Go for it. Yeah. Um, hi, Patrick. I just uh, picked up a, a, bo a book yesterday. Um, by Sammy Harkham. It's called Blood of the Virgin. Oh, yeah. And I flipped it over and there was a quote from you on the back. Yeah. And I was just... <laughs> I, haven't I haven't read it yet because I just bought it yesterday. But I, was, I just thought since I'm here, I'd ask you what your relationship is like to comics. I came out of, blur I came out of Blurb Retirement to blurb that book. But it's not... Sammy started that book, I want to say 12 years ago. And he asked me seven or eight years ago if I would blurb it, and I said yes. And then I went into blurb retirement. And then he came back, and I finished the book. I said, well, I don't do this anymore. And he said, but you said you would. And, OK, fine. It's a masterpiece. That book is really special. My relationship to comics is I understand that there's uncommonly beautiful work being made right now, and I'm just sort of woefully ignorant of it. Um, I'm an admirer of a, of a man named, who goes by CF, Christopher Forgs, who writes just idiosyncratic, completely unique, bizarre comics. Um, and his, the craft, like his lines are, are, are remarkable. Sammy, I've known, I met Sammy when he was maybe eight, seven or eight years old. Um, Sammy lived in a house in Los Angeles and me and my friend Anton moved into his attic. It was a large house and Sammy's older brother his name Jonathan was a musician, and he had a recording studio in the attic of this old house. And my friend Anton and I fancied ourselves to be musician-ish people, and we sort of tricked Jonathan into letting us. The idea was that we would all live together and write a record, but we just wound up doing a lot of drugs, and no record was made. <laughs> but then I remember Jonathan saying, you should meet my brother Sammy. He's a really special kid. And we came downstairs, and there was Sammy sitting on the edge of his made bed. And I, I'm remembering him as almost sort of like as if he was wearing a suit or something like that, but that doesn't really make sense. He was probably just a regular Southern Californian kid sitting on the edge of his bed. But in my mind, in my memory, <laughs> Sammy was this sort of like, you know, very strange sort of like Wednesday Adams type <laughs> kid. And years later, Sammy had grown up, and he had a beard, and he talks really loud. And he's a man, and he had a great bookstore in Los Angeles called Family. And I said, uh, you know, you probably don't remember me, but I, and I described myself, and he goes, oh, you were one of those weird vampire guys that lived in my <laughs> attic. Because I was terrified of you guys. What were you doing up there? And, um, yeah, time passed, and, and he became, he grew up to be just a really uh, brilliant, 
artist and storyteller. And he's, I don't, we only talk about once a year, or if he's in town or if I'm down there, I'll see him. But when we talk, we talk for three hours or something like that. Like, we just can't keep up. We have a, a connection, um, but we're both busy doing our thing in different parts of the world. So we don't visit that much. But I was happy to give him a quote because that book is really uncommonly ambitious and, and beautiful in its way. Why so. did you go into blurb retirement? Oh, it's relentless. And also, I just think that blur, blur being... I, I would like for there to be a, an industry-wide strike. I think that we should take to the streets and just abandon the blurb <laughs> so that the first printing of a book has nothing on it. But, you know, like, I didn't want to get any blurbs. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm sort of against the, the practice because it's relentless and the language is hysterical mm. and people are lying on books every day. And I, I got to the point where I would write a blurb, blurb and I would write an honest blurb where I would say something complimentary about the book and without fail every time they'd say, but can you, can you just punch it up a bit? <laughs> and they wanted you to sound, I mean, everyone goes to 11 with blurbs. They're mm. just insane about it. And if you don't say this is unequivocally the best book that's ever been written in the history of mankind, then it's considered tepid. So I just don't like, I don't like, I don't like it. Um, so yeah, first printing of the book, have either praise from your earlier works, or if it's your first book, get a blurb or two. But when it's like stacked with like 11 blurbs, like it's like 11 Pulitzer Prize winning authors are weighing in, it just stops meaning something. And it's also just, um, it's fatiguing to look down at your desk and have, talk about interrupting one's quest. Mm. You know, I'm just minding my own business reading Barbara Pym novels, and now I have to read seven <laughs> contemporary novels <laughs> that are Westerns because I once wrote a sort of Western. Like, this doesn't make sense to me. So let's just give, let's just give up, give it up. You just need a stamp that says enough's enough that you just stamp in all the yeah. books and send yeah, yeah, them yeah, back. Yeah. Um, we've got time for this one last question down the front. Um, did someone have their hand up down here? But yes, it is you. Um, Thank you. Uh, there you are. Thanks. Um, I'm curious when you're coming to read the books, do you sort of create the characters first or the story or is it based on what's going on in your life at the time that inspires you? Like, what's yeah. your process with that? Yeah, it's always character for me and that's sort of the beginning and the end. And that's why I can't begin a book in earnest until I've gotten a, a real grip on who the protagonist is. Um, Story tends to come after, and I don't think of my works as being particularly strong on story. I think enough occurs that hopefully it's fascinating, enough to read the book, right? To buy the book and read the book and enjoy the book, but it's much more about the human being, the, human, the, the connection between the, the characters, uh, their dialogue. Dialogue is sort of being my great love. And then, um, you know, not that much happens to Bob in, this, in the course of this book, but because it's Bob, it's interesting to me, you know? So I, I'm, it's an affinity for the inner lives of the people of the books, whether or not it's displayed, whether or not we know what their inner lives are. Um, it's, about, it's about their existence within the confines of the universe of the book rather than any sort of page-turning plot device. Not to thumb my nose at plot. It's, it's difficult to do plot well. And I actually have it in my mind that I would like to do plot better. I think that's one of the things I would like to change about my work is I'd like to lean into that a little bit more. And, and you can talk of, to Stephen King about it. What's that? You can talk to Stephen King about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Steve. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. I think I answered the question. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. Fuck, we're lucky to be here. We're really lucky. Lucky to be readers, lucky to be writers, lucky to sit in the presence of a writer that we admire so much, whose work we love. I um, feel lucky that my old job at the Writers' Festival meant that we could meet. Yeah. I love your work. I love you as a person. It's Thank so nice you. to be here talking to you tonight. Uh, don't forget to go and support our beautiful local booksellers at Hill of Content, and Patrick will be at the back signing books, and you can ask him more questions about pot. I assume, or his writing practice. Uh, if you'll join me in, please, uh, thank, thank you to Patrick DeWitt. Thank you. And now you may all go. <laughs> thank you all.